All right. Well, we're going to, this is our last study in The Bride of Christ. And uh, it is, uh, there's a parody of what we have studied uh, about the bride. And the, the final aspect of this study is that Satan also has an imitator. He is, uh, he is the great imitator of everything that God does. He has a design. He imitates because he wants to be like God. That's his desire. He even quoted that, I'm going to be like God. But he's not God. But he is the great imitator. He has is, he is successfully produced a counterfeit bride. Her description is given in Revelation 17. If you'll go ahead and open your Bibles to that uh, book in that chapter, Revelation 17. And what the bride of Satan or the counterfeit bride is, is the consummation or the fulfillment of religious Babylon. Uh, the sinkhole of all false religions. She is the consummate. She is the fulfillment of all false religions. And we know how important it is to stay in the Word of God as baptized believers. We have a pastor that preaches the Word and encourages us to abide by the teachings of the Bible. God's own Word tells us to study to show thyself approved. And, and uh, But study what? Study the Bible. Study the Word to show thyself approved. In contrast to that, there are religious groups all around the world that do not preach this very thing. They do not preach study to show thyself approved. They do not preach that. They don't want you to study to show thyself approved. Many religions around the world, they never say from the pulpit or whatever they're speaking from, open your Bibles to. There's no, nothing like that. That's one of the first things any man that steps in that pulpit will say. May go through a little uh, words beforehand, but within the first one to two, three minutes, open your Bibles too. But there's many churches and religious groups around the world that do not do that. In fact, some religions want you to have a Bible on your coffee table or in the bookshelf somewhere, but that's where it needs to be kept. Why is that? They are wolves in sheep's clothing is why. They're leading the sheep to the slaughter. When it's mass time or service time, the sheep just need to hear what the person in the pulpit is saying. Male, female, pedophile, and I could go on and on. But regardless, the true holy word of God is not preached. The shed blood of Jesus Christ, we know that it is the only way to God. Ye must believe. No one can pay or pray someone else into the kingdom of God. That is impossible. God's word tells us exactly what must be done to spend eternity with him in the kingdom of God. Satan has all kinds of false religions set up around the world. False idol worship, humanism. There are literally, literally thousands of confusing and wicked ways that Satan is currently using to keep good, honest people Simple people away from the glory of Christ. Satan has this set up. He's done this from the beginning of his time. And he still continues today. Satan has went so far in being an imitator, but he, he has went so far as to set up a false bride. And why is that? We've already said. Because he wants to imitate everything God does. Revelation 17, we'll start in verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, this is John, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. 
So she carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wandered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So letter A here in your handout, we're going to look at the name of the false bride. The name of the false bride. We named the bride of Christ as his faithful churches. Through Scripture, we did this. Here in verse 1, the Bible names the false bride as, number one, the great whore. The great whore. The definition of the false bride's name is exactly the opposite of 2 Corinthians 11.2, which describes the bride of Christ as what? We've studied this. The direct opposite of the great whore is what? It's a virgin, a chaste virgin. So Satan set up an imitation, but it is the direct opposite of a chaste virgin, the great whore. 2 Corinthians 11.2 says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's, the, that's his faithful churches. The, fall, the, 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 the chaste virgin. Look at verse number 5 here. Verse number 5 here in Revelation 17 says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The words, uh, number two there, Mystery, Babylon the Great, identifies her as a true pagan. She has true pagan origins. The rest of verse 5 says, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The false bride is not only called the great whore, but she is the mother of whores. It calls her the mother of harlots. She is not just the great whore, but the mother of whores. Letter B says, uh, well, the nature of the false bride. So we, we, we know her name. We know what the Bible calls her. But the nature of the false bride. Number one, verse one, number one, she sitteth upon many waters. This means that she is a universal church. She sitteth upon many waters waters. She is a universal church. In Revelation 17, down in verse 15, it defines these, uh, the uni that she setteth upon many waters, as these peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. She is a universal church worldwide already. 
there's a universal church, I just said this, but it's, it's operating right now, and it has been for centuries. Let's look at the first part of verse number 2 again. Verse number 2 says the first part there, "...with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication." The kings represent the state or government. She has joined church and state in fornication. She is a state church. She's not only a universal church, she is a state church. She has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. Verse number three, number three says she is full of names of blasphemy. This means that she is a pagan. Number four, the first part of verse four says she is arrayed in purple and scarlet color. And this means she is a pompous church. These are, if you'll notice, this is everything that is not a New Testament church. She is the direct opposite, but she is set up in the same order as our local church, but on a much grander scale. The Bible doesn't teach that as a way that we should be bringing praise to Him. We are a local church. We are not a pompous church. We are not a universal church. We are not a state church. She is a pompous church. Number five, the last part of verse number four says, she is decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And this shows that she is a wealthy church. Wealthy. We'll come, to, we'll, we'll come back to this point in just a little bit when we talk about the identity of the false bride here in just a minute. We'll come back to this. But let's look at verse number 6. It says, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Verse number, or, or number six in your handout, she is a persecuting church. She is a persecuting church. She is intoxicated with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. The false bride has set her diet with greed and it's the blood of those that have been murdered for the cause of Jesus Christ. It's, for the, it's the blood of those that have been tortured, burned alive, that she drinks and she, she, she is drunk on their blood. Some, some have been the spectacle, the spectacle of games, excuse me, fed to the lions as crowds watched and cheered, laying wagers on those precious souls. She is drunk with their blood, Christians. That's what it describes here. The false bride is described as drunk with the blood of these saints and these martyrs. I could go, I, we, could spend, we could spend hours upon hours about martyrism and, and things that the church in Rome has done in history. History books have been rewritten. But if you find some good old, old history books tucked away there, there's some history with the church in Rome and the persecution that she has done. Let her see the identity of the false bride. According to verse 9, the woman sits on seven mountains. Verse number 9, I can't talk this morning. And verse number 9 says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. The only, Bible, the only city in the Bible, the only city in the biblical world built upon this number of hills is Rome. It's the only city. The ancient city of Rome sits on the Aventine, the the Calian, uh, the Capitoline, the Esquiline, the Palatine, the Quir uh, Quirinal, 
the Viminal, Viminal Hills. There's seven hills that the, that the ancient city of Rome sits on. Today, the church of Rome and her offspring are coming together in a concerted effort to bring a one world end time religious body. They're working with many of her offspring. There's, we could go through a laundry list of the offspring of the church in Rome. The multifaceted ecumenical movement is their present day mechanism. It's going on today. They've even extended their arms out to Islam, the false religion, to go hand in hand. It's, it's happening today. I said a few minutes ago we would come back to the subject of the point there in number five in your outline. The Bible says there in verse four, she is decked with gold and precious stones and pearls showing that the false bride is a wealthy church. Have you ever wondered just how wealthy the church in Rome really is? Staggering. We're going to spend the rest of our morning here just this morning just kind of going through that part. We'll have a short lesson this morning if you want to think about maybe a testimony or something when we finish. But I felt it very necessary that we bring these points to mind because they're important. Um, the Bible clearly says the, the identity of the false bride. And here are some numbers. Here are some things to, to kind of just way on. I looked at numerous sources online as I was studying for this, and this is just a glimpse of those sources and the true financial worth of the Church of Rome. The Vatican has large investments with Rothschilds of Britain, France, and America. The Rothschilds. They have investments with Hambro's Bank, and with the Credit Suisse in London and Zurich. In the United States, it has large investments in Morgan Bank, the Chase Manhattan Bank, the First National Bank of New York, the Bankers Trust and Company, and many, many others. The Vatican has billions of shares in the most powerful international corporations in the world, such as Gulf Oil, Shell Oil, General Motors, Bethlehem Steel, General Electric, IBM, TWA, some of the most wealthy companies in the world, and they have billions of shares in those companies. Some idea of the real estate and other forms of wealth controlled by the Catholic Church may, may be gathered in a remark that was made by a member of the New York Catholic Conference. Namely, he said his church probably ranks second only to the United States government in total annual purchase. It ranks second only to the U.S. government in that regard. Another statement by, made by a nationally syndicated Catholic priest perhaps is even more telling. He says the Catholic Church must be the biggest corporation in the United States. We have branch offices in every neighborhood. Every neighborhood. Our assets and real estate holdings must exceed those of Standard Oil, AT&T, and U.S. Steel combined. Combined. Wealthy, wealthy companies. And our roster of dues-paying members is second only to the tax rolls of the United States. The tax rolls of the United States, they come in second place. Wealth. The, the Catholic Church, once all our assets have been put together, is the most formidable stockbroker in the world, the entire world. The Vatican... Independently of each successive pope has been increasingly oriented towards the U.S. The Wall Street Journal said that 
the Vatican's financial deals in the U.S. alone were so big that very often it sold or bought gold in lots of millions, by the millions or more dollars at one time. Their wealth alone is so big that they have to buy gold with it. The Vatican's treasure of solid gold has been estimated by the United Nations World Magazine to amount to several billion dollars in just gold alone. Just gold alone. Count up all the rest of the stuff that we've mentioned, but just in gold alone. Several billion dollars. A large bulk of this gold is stored in, in the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank, while also in banks in England and Switzerland hold the rest. This is just a small portion of the wealth of the Vatican, which is in the U.S. alone, is greater than the five wealthiest giant corporations of this country together. Added to all the real estate, the property, stocks, and shares around the world, the staggering accumulation of the wealth of the Catholic Church becomes so formidable as to defy any rational assessment. It cannot be, it cannot be measured. That's how wealthy the church in Rome is. Nobody truly knows. We've just named a few things. The Catholic Church is the biggest financial power wealth accumulator and property owner in existence today, period, above anybody. She is a greater possessor of material riches than any other single institution, corporation, bank, trust, government, or state of the whole globe, the church in Rome. The Pope, as the visible ruler of this wealth, is consequently the richest individual of the 21st or the 20th century. No one can realistically assess how much he's worth in the terms of billions. One of the most challenging questions regarding the moral conduit of the Catholic Church was asked by one of the sources that I was reading from uh, of, of this information. It's, he asked, Jesus was the poorest of the poor. Roman Catholicism, which claims to be his church, is the richest of the rich, the wealthiest institution on earth. How come that such an institution ruling in the name of this itinerant preacher, Jesus Christ, whose want was such that he had not even a pillow to lay his head on, is now so top-heavy in riches How is that? The combined might of the most redoubtable financial trust of the most potent industrial supergiants and of the most prosperous global co corporation in the world, how is that? How can they say that they... are with Jesus, the poorest of the poor. How can they put those two things together? Their wealth, when we're talking about their wealth, their wealth is so big that they, cre that they themselves could create sustainable social programs to completely end worldwide famine. They could end it today. Do they do that? Mm -mm. No. I found most of the articles that I was reading from very interesting. I also find it interesting how all of their wealth is swept under the carpet. Just swept. I also find it interesting how many crimes seem to just fade away. The power of Satan here on this world is incredible. This this false bride, the church of the uh, the, of Rome 
is so corrupt and wicked. But they claim to be Christian. The wickedness of the false bride will be exposed for all of us to see someday. Satan's going to go to war with a lamb. How many lambs do you know that fight? You ever seen a lamb rear its teeth? No. You ever see a lamb chase anything except for each other playfully? No. But we serve a lamb of God. Our lamb of God's going to win this war and will not back down. He will not tuck his tail and run. We serve that lamb. We already know who's going to win this war, and I thank God that we are on the winning side. We're on the winning side of this. I wanted just to bring to light some of these um, sources that put into terms just how wealthy this church in Rome really is, how it is not a local New Testament church, how it does not use its wealth to bring glory to God's name. You know, in, in, in contrast, we're a local, independent, Bible-believing Baptist church. We share our um, what am I trying to say? We, we share our bank statements. We share our budget publicly to our church. We know where every dime is going. If you really want to know, you can ask. The pastor doesn't hide it. It's there. We share our tithes and offerings worldwide to help missionaries spread the gospel. Satan's, Satan has a church set up that's the, one of the most wealthiest well, it is the wealthiest in the world. Second to the United States government. They have the power to rule this world and spread the gospel to every living creature there is. It's not being done. So you see a lot of contrast between the local independent church full of faithful believers in Christ and the wealthiest church in the world that never brings this to the pulpit, opens it, and says, open your Bibles to see what God has to say about everything that we live for, everything that we um, experience in life. All answers are in that book. The answers are not in the subject behind the pulpit or wherever they may stand. It's not there. So there's exact opposites of what God has set up for His churches and what Satan has set up for His churches. So I hope you understand. I hope we kind of put things in perspective about the bride of Christ. Next week, we're going to begin uh, letter C. We've covered apostasy, the bride of Christ. We begin the crucified life next week. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. I, I have not even looked at it. I hope, it's, I hope it brings to light some of the things that we studied in uh, Change to his, Into His Image. I, think we, I hope it kind of brings back some of that uh, in our lessons of the crucified life. Because um, we, all, we, all, we all need to hear that. We all need to continue in our mission that God has set for us, living the crucified life.